All right. Let's, uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, first of all, my name is Jonathan House. I work at a company here in town called uh, um, Amersys. It is a medical software company, small medical software. We have approximately 35, 40 people on the team right now. And uh, the four years that I've been there, we've grown from a size of probably half that. Uh, probably through no fault of my own, but uh, you know, progress changes things. Um, the reason why I'm here today is because at least some of the conference organizers here think I know what I'm talking about uh, as far as Agile and architecture is concerned. Uh, so we'll find out if I, uh, if I actually do know anything about this or not. Um, this is a tutorial, not a talk. If I'm doing most of the talking, there's a problem because this is about exploring, exploring things. This is not a deeply technical session. We will not be spending a huge amount of time on 14 million different acronym type things that sit underneath architecture. We're, we're looking for patterns. We're looking for the big picture of architecture so we can see what sort of things we have to deal with on a regular basis to make our jobs easier, especially in an agile environment when things are changing constantly. So that's the purpose of the sessions. If you do not have architectural experience, if you do not write code, great. I'm glad you're here because you are going to serve a very important part of this discussion today. You're going to be part of the discussion where you look across the board for a while and realize what, what all was uh, part of these changes that we have to make. So that's the purpose of today. Uh, before I really get started, though, I wanted to share something with you. This morning I was uh, reading one of my uh, mailing lists, and I saw a post come in from somebody who shall remain nameless. But they're probably not here anyway, probably not even in the country. But their title on the, on the email was Agile Java Architect. And I thought that was kind of funny. I thought it was a lot funny, actually. Uh, not the least of which is because I have no idea what that means. <laughs> so, I mean, if you take these pieces separately, Agile, you know what that is. We're all here for that purpose, right? Java, pretty self-explanatory. An architect. What does an agile Java architect do? Designs buildings while drinking coffee, balancing on a ball. Exactly. <laughs> or there's one other over here too. Oh, the architect agile Java. The architect agile Java. I've seen a lot of. Java. <laughs> uh, I've never seen any agile Java yet, but that, that's uh, that's just how it goes. Anyways. There's a lot of talk right now about uh, the transition of Agile, Agile fundamentally being a people process, um, over to the world of architecture. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. These things are related to each other, but also kind of orthogonal to each other. And that's really where we could run into problems. We need to understand that Agile is a, is a, is a methodology, it's a process, it's a way of doing things. Architecture is a means of doing things. But they also have a big impact on each other. So we wanna make sure that there's a, you know, that we understand both and, and can work in a way that uh, we're not going to at least kill each other on one side or another, depending upon the choice that we make on the opposite side. So, without further ado, how many in the room are developers or architects? People that have had their hands in code, write code on a regular basis, or have written code? Okay. <laughs> Pulling his arm down. <laughs> Apparently your code isn't that good. <laughs> oh, is he a manager now? Yeah. You've been elevated, so you can't touch code anymore. I, I was actually at my company, I was told that I can no longer write code for the teams, like production systems, so I, I feel your pain. Uh, how many of you are management or executive? Uh, and that you don't write code, your job is to make sure that we actually make something for you. Good, that's good. Uh, executives, anybody at, at the C-level, uh, officer level of the company? Well, there's one. Right there, one, two, <laughs> okay, good. Um, your experience is going to be very valuable here. We, um, we're going to be organizing yourself into teams very shortly, and I want a blend of technical and non-technical people on the teams because when we get stuck, when we start talking about architecture, the fundamental drivers for architecture are usually business oriented, and you'll see that as we go through our exercises. And without the business perspective there, if it's just the technical architecture or the technical perspective, we, uh, we tend to be a little incestuous at times, don't we, Tex? We try not to, but it happens. So, the point of the session today is not to give you a deep understanding of, of architecture. It's really to give you an exposure to the forces, the patterns that, that occur, so that we can start looking down into the details. Um, the concept of architecture, software architecture, is huge. There's been hundreds of books <coughs> written on it. There's millions of electrons on the web devoted to uh, this information. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that have uh, devoted their careers to this subject. So I'm certainly not going to accomplish anything in 90 minutes that they haven't already done for us or at least communicated. We just want to get, we just want to kind of op open the uh, open the kimono, so to speak, and take a look at what's going on. 
and uh, get rid of all the day-to-day -day distractions that keep us from seeing what's going on in the architecture. Um, how many of you have been in a training session with Alistair before? At some point. Okay, He's going to pop over every once in a while. When he comes over, let me know so that we can, you know, act like we're doing something important. <laughs> the um, one of the things that I love about, about Alistair is that he he um, looks at the detail. He looks at what it really takes to get things done, but he also looks at the meta concepts. He's a he's a great high level strategic thinker. One of the things that uh, he says all the time that I picked up um, as a habit is talking at uh, the Shu, Ha, and Re levels. Has anyone heard that before? I know a few of us have. What that means, Shu Ha is, um, is a series of Japanese terms, comes from uh, martial arts initially, but really what it says is there's different levels of experience. And when you are at a level of experience, there's only a certain way that you can communicate or be communicated to where it makes sense. And the higher up you go in experience, the more communication you can accept, the more abstract concepts, so finally you get to a point where you can really understand the big picture and apply it in specific situations. The problem is that as we go up and down, we don't always pay attention to where people are relative to the shoe hot levels. Now, if I'm going to build myself as an architect, I would probably say that maybe I could claim to be a, a, a re-level architect. I've seen a lot of systems, designed a lot of systems, I've failed a lot of times, and I've succeeded just often enough to make me think, yeah, I can talk about this. But if I'm talking to somebody that's doing architecture for, for the first time, are we going to communicate on the same level? No. So in the discussion today, um, I want you to be cognizant of that. And as you are talking amongst yourselves and your groups, make sure that you're talking across those boundaries. If you're really deep in the technical stuff, take a step back, simplify it. If you're deep in business stuff, again, simplify it so that the other side of the technical slash business divide can understand. I'll try to do the same thing as well. Um, every once in a while I geek out, so I apologize in advance, but uh, we'll try to keep it at a, at a simple level as possible. All right, so definitions. Um, we've covered the Agile Job Architect. Now I want to cover definitions a little bit. We're going to be using a few terms in here. I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. First one is Agile. You'd think we've been spending a day talking about this already. Some of us have been to multiple conferences talking about this for years. But we'd have the same definition of what Agile means. What does Agile mean in terms of software? Specifically in terms of software architecture things that are going to keep our software running over time. What does that mean? Easy to change. Easy to change. Okay, flexible. Can I say flexible? My handwriting is horrible, so I apologize for right off the bat. What else? Mitigating the risk. Say it again? Mitigating the risk. Okay, mitigating the risk. Very good. Two more. We'll keep it short. Yes, sir. Understandable. Understandable. Get expand on that a little bit. So it feeds into the, I suppose, the flexible and the, and the mitigating risk. But um, an architecture that is very elegant, but it takes you weeks of careful study to really grok, um, isn't so great because people who are going to be doing the work on that system aren't necessarily going to all grok it. So something where you can look at it and go. Ah, I understand what this is doing. Okay, so visibility, understandability, would that be a fair uh, way of stating that? Absolutely. Okay. One more. Yes, sir. Scalable. Scalable. Agile, scalable? Size meets, meets the size to whatever size it needs. Okay, so we can, we can make our, can we really make our Agile teams bigger? <laughs> I'm kidding, it's a loaded question. It is, it is scalable, it's adjustable. Again, it gets back to the flexible concept, but we can adjust over time, right? All right, so Agile, really, we're getting into the heart of what Agile is. It's iterative, it is flexible, it responds to change, um, we reflect, short increments, all those things are important to us. That th allows us to deliver software, the software that we need at the time we need it, okay? And very important concepts. Let's take a look at the words that show up for architecture. Maybe we'll post those out there. Hopefully we'll get them up at the wall at some point. Francine, would you mind just throwing them up on the wall somewhere? Thank you. By the way, everybody, this is Francine. She'll be assisting me today. Give her hand. Please design her hand. Yeah, that's what it takes to get a good review out of this session. I'm so small because I know nothing about what you guys are talking about, except that easy to understand, Agile. <laughs> 
Architecture. Give me some words associated with architecture. When we think of architecture, what do we think about? Design. Design. Okay. What does this look like? How is it going to work? <coughs> what else? Strategy. Strategy. Strategic, right? Got to think for the long term. High level. High level? Okay. Abstract? Yeah, abstract. Two more. Scalable. Scalable. You're going to get it in there sooner. <laughs> adoptable. Adoptable? Adoptable or adaptable? Adoptable. Adoptable. Say a little more about that. So uh, <clears throat> if, if you're building an architecture, presumably you're wasting your time on this because you've got a whole staff of people who are going to have to conform to it. If it's just you, then do what you want. And so <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of ports, architectural forces that are required to allow your staff to actually be able to conform your architecture. Has to be adoptable. Okay, does so that make sense? We agree with that? Has to be adoptable. So the greatest architecture in the world doesn't make any sense if nobody can jump in and use it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so architecture, We've got some words. Now, if you look at the words, and if Francine will hurry up and get this on the wall. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we look at the words on the list, you'll find that we've got flexible, we've got adjustable. Big surprise on the agilist, right? But over here, we've got strategic, we've got you know high level. We've got some different terms here. What what's the what's the fundamental disparity between these two? What's the difference? We're talking about agile. We're really planning for the tactical, whereas we're talking about architecture. We're really planning for strategic. Strategic, okay. And that's where we run into problems, and that's why this is so hard, because we've got to balance these things. And that's the point of the session today. All right, a couple other things real quick, just so that we're using the same terms um, as we're talking through this time. Architecture, when we talk about architecture today, we will be referring to application architecture. There is a general, more generalized concept of enterprise architecture, which is you know, the basis which you know, a whole organization or a whole enterprise runs on. We're going to focus specifically on <coughs> application context today. The uh, other thing is, uh, how many of you have seen uh, uh, Martin Fowler's book on uh, uh, architectural habits? Anybody seen that book? A few of us out here? Okay. All right. In the book, uh, one of the things that we've talked about over time is the structure or the how architecture is laid out and conceptualized. We're going to be using three terms today, and I'm, I, I borrow these from Martin Fowler. The terms are: we talk about the the front end of the application. We're talking about the presentation today, right? Okay. So we have presentation. Behind that, so it's what? What is it? Business layer. Business layer. Domain logic. Okay. Anything else that should go on that list? Data. Data? Just data. Big pile of data out there. Okay. What does data sit in? Persistence. Okay. And if we take persistence as a class of system. To a more generalized concept, what are we talking about? Persistence is one major piece of most applications. We also sometimes talk to other applications as well. So really what we're talking about, we talk about persistence and other things is integration. Integration, external systems. Okay, so those are the three main areas we're going to be working in today. External systems. Anybody have clear on, on those three concepts? Generalized enough? Okay, let's move on. Um, the other thing that we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking about when we get down to the design work, the exercises you're going to be doing, you'll be spending most of your time today working on two things. You're going to be identifying common functionality for applications. These are generally frameworks, components, toolkits, things like this. We can name a hundred if we ran around the room a couple of times. The other thing that we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about customized code. Customized code meaning code that we write for that particular application. We draw a line between these two because they're architecturally interesting and they differ from each other. And we'll find out as we go along in this exercise. Okay, so uh, we said that we we're going to uh, spread the teams around a little bit. Those of you who are not technical, um, what I'd like you to do, we're going to shuffle the room around a little bit. There's two things that I'm going to ask. First of all, uh, I want to ask that you guys, um, when you start to coalesce into groups, please do not try to get with a group of people that you work with on a regular basis. Um, learning is uh, sometimes it can be a painful exercise. 
uh, at the very least, it should be instructive. And when you hear other people, when you talk to other people, you're going to learn things that you may not learn from somebody you sit next to every day doing your job. So please try to get with a group of people that you haven't met before and uh, as you're going through. I would ask that the non-technical people just stand up for me for a moment. Excellent. And what I'd like to do is, um, amongst these one, two, three, four, five, six tables here, let's, uh, we'll slide that one over and slide this one out a little bit. Just go ahead and distribute yourselves equally amongst those six tables. We're gonna use you as a basis for forming our teams. So one or two at each of the tables would be great. Okay, we have a lot of work to do in a very short amount of time. So I want to introduce the exercise, and uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm asking you to actually run through this exercise with me as we do this, to kind of introduce how this game is going to be played. Um, you're going to need a couple of things first. Each table, you should have a couple of different colors of post-it notes. You should have at least a few pieces of chart paper, probably about six would be good, and uh, Sharpies to write on. So if you don't have it, Water. come on over to the table, grab yourself some supplies. Okay, each table, uh, chart paper, two different colors of post-its, and at least one Sharpie, right? Excellent, all right. Um, this is a, it should be a relatively simple game, but it's surprisingly how, it's frightening how complex it gets because we're talking about architecture. There's a lot of ways to skin this particular cat. So, we're gonna set out some rules. We're probably gonna break them, and we're gonna have a mess when we, uh, we start to deal with them, but hopefully we'll, we'll uh, understand the, the general rule of the game over time. The idea here is that we're gonna give you an initial architecture. We're gonna give you the actual technologies that you're gonna work with today. Sorry, but I'd love to have everybody pick their own, but um, we'll be here for a long time if that happens. The second thing I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you the initial rounds of the game that we're going to play. And I'll show this, I'll walk you through it so you can understand how it works. After that, it's going to be your job to take the game on and play the subsequent rounds. My job is to give you changes to the business. And I've got a whole interesting stack of them here. Okay? Your job is to figure out how your architecture is going to respond to those changes over time. The important part about this is we get through a lot of iterations of this because we want to see patterns, we want to see things develop. And if we don't get through multiple iterations of this, it's really hard to see the patterns that develop. So we're going to go through, we're going to start out slow with this initial tutorial round, and then afterwards we're going to speed things up and we're going to put a lot of pressure on you guys to just get this thing done quickly. So that being said, uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, the understanding of what the system is. We are building software for an auto insurance company. And this is claims management software. Does anybody actually work for an insurance company? Show of hands. Okay. Forget everything that you know about your domain, because it's going to be too complicated to bring in here. When we talk about functionality, we're going to be talking about bullet points. Okay. You'll notice that the stickies on in front of you are very small. That's a hit. Use that. We're going to be talking about functionality in general terms. The functionality is interesting because that's what our system does but it's not interesting when we're taking a step back and looking at architecture. Not as interesting, I should say. So here's what you're gonna have. Um, you're gonna start off with two sheets, and uh, as, as we start, as I start working with these, I want you to copy what we've got up here on the board, and I'll I'm gonna give you the tour of these in just a second. First one, you've got a sheet, and it's gonna be divided into three sections. At the top, we've got a presentation, we've got domain, and we've got persistence slash external. This is going to be our current architecture. At any given point, we should be able to look at this one sheet that's going to remain during the session and see what your architecture looks like. Look at all the colored stickies and see what we've got. There's a second sheet that you're going to have. This is change motivation. This is going to track our architecture over time. What you do here is you're going to have a section where you actually identify what the change motivation is, what happened to your business. And then down here, you're going to identify the changes to your presentation, your domain, and your external systems. And we'll keep doing this until we get a lot of things done or we dissolve into chaos, one of the two. Okay? So that's the general that's the general theory behind the game here. Now we'll see if it actually works this way. What I'd like you to do is for the first two rounds, so that we're all starting at the same place, just kind of play along with me as, as we do this. Okay? So, oh, I should probably cover the architecture, shouldn't I? So you don't want to get right to implementation, the typical developer. <coughs> the architecture, um, how many of you work on Java? More or less Java technologies. Okay, a few, a few. Uh, Ruby Rails, that sort of thing. Show of hands. .NET. Ooh. Uh oh, we're in trouble. No, I'm kidding. 
the idea here is that we have to pick an architecture to work with, and since I'm the guy that's doing the session, I got to pick the architecture. So we're going to use a Java. Uh, we're going to use the Java technology platform. Very simple. Let's just lay this out real quick. Uh, first of all, the legend. If you see a, a blue green sticky up here, this implies that this is framework and tools as far as the architecture is concerned. This is stuff that is not written specifically for your application. This is more generalized stuff. So you'll see the framework and tools for that. Okay. The orange, the pink orange stickies are for domain logic. This is business logic for the application. Domain logic is actually not the right term because that implies that it sits in this layer. This is code that you write for that application. It could be presentation, it could be domain, it could be persistence. It doesn't matter. We just want the two different colors so you can see the differences. Does that make sense? Please explain that again. Sorry. Sure, no problem. So you've got two different colors. <coughs> one color you're going to use to specify uh, frameworks, gotcha. tools. Okay. Second one is application specific logic. This is the code that you write for that application. On the frameworks and tools, we're going to ask you to do two things. One, give it a name. And then two, a very brief description. <coughs> you cannot go any longer than a sentence today on anything. So the, the framework piece, the framework sticky should have a name, whatever you want to call it, once we start adding architecture, and it should have a description. The application specific code will only have a description on it. We're going to talk about the business purpose of that particular piece of code. With me so far? Sorry, I'm going fast. We just uh, we have to get to the game, and it's you know the playing of the game is the important part here. So we'll just stick these up here, and hopefully they'll stay. So we have a legend. All right. Now let's actually look at an example. The architecture we've chosen, as I said, is Java stack across the board. And when I say Java, it's primarily Java. It doesn't mean that everything here is Java. And here we go. So on the front end, I have C. Anybody worked with C before? One person? Wow, I picked them well, didn't I? Okay, it doesn't matter except for the fact that um, the application itself, Seam is the name, it is a JavaScript slash dynamic HTML um, interface layer. That's all it does, it's going to deliver that up. Now, Seam does more than that, but we're going to keep it simple on the student. So that's what our architecture is for the front end. That's what's driving our actual screens. In addition to that, I also need something that binds my user interface back to the, the business tier. So I've got a second piece of architecture up there, and that is the UI binding. This is also Seam that covers this, it provides the same functionality. So that goes there as well. Okay, so I've got my architecture, I've got my architectural elements, the, the framework style elements for my first tier. In the middle, Spring. Anybody work with Spring? Okay, a couple. All right, Spring is just a, it's a business logic framework, it provides a lot of basic services. Um, there's no magic about it other than the fact that it's really, it's really specified to sit on that domain too. So, Spring is going to be our initial business logic framework. Okay? And if you haven't done so already, go ahead and start creating these stickies because these will change over time. And then stick them on your, uh, on your sheet that's looking to look something like this. Two other pieces, and I'll give you a minute to catch up on the architecture. On the back end, we know that we need to be able to persist our system, right? Probably a good idea. On the back end, we're going to have two pieces. One is an API. The API that we're chosen today. The API that we've chosen today is called JPA. It's yeah. the uh, Sir Java Persistence Architecture. So we'll put that on the back end. And the final one, we like Postgres. Anybody else like Postgres? Woo! All right. I like Fox I like I really back the loser here. Okay, so Postgres is our actual database system. Why did we break this out? Why did we specify JPA and Postgres? What's that? They're changing. This is not, these are not a, a fundamental unit. These are two separate things that do uh, similar related behavior, but you can change them. So you want to get down to a finite level. Okay, go ahead and take a minute, 60 seconds. Just real quick, draw the page. This is going to be your permanent architecture. And you stick it on Okay, now, this is a great architecture. Now we're going to mess it up by putting business logic in them. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to add our application specific code. We're going to switch stickies. What I'd like you to do is as we create these up here, I'd like you to do it in your group as well. So go ahead and elect whoever is going to be uh, described temporarily as we create these. Now in order for us to create this, in order for us to create this, we have to understand exactly what it is that we're building. Okay? These are the change cards. Now obviously the first change is we have to have something to start with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just identify very quickly at a high level what the functionality is, and then we'll continue on from there and we'll see what stickies generate. Now I'm going to have I'm going to have Francine actually write these for me because as you can see my stuff is completely illegible, even if you do get up close. So the first one is this is an auto insurance claim processing system. Okay, we get a very simple one to start with. We're going to be making it more complex as time goes on. The first thing is we need to be able to create the claims and capture data associated with the claim. That's it. Now we can talk about the details of what data, what does a claim look like, things like that. But again, from the architectural perspective, from the perspective that we're looking at today, not really important. We're going to, as we go through these rounds, you're going to um, have a chance to question the customer, meaning me, at the beginning of the round after I explain to you what the change is. And I'm going to identify the things that you should pay attention to and the things that you shouldn't. If it's something that isn't really relevant to the exercise, I'll say, I'll say that it's not relevant, so you don't have to worry about it. If it is, then you want to keep an eye on it or keep track of it somehow. I may lie. Of course, that never happens in July. But. Okay, so the first one, we need to be able to, on the user interface, capture claims, right? We have to have a screen to be able to create claims. So on the user interface, we have functionality, create claims. So we've got creating claims on the user interface. That sets on our CM architecture, right? Okay. In addition to that, we also have business logic for, we have to be able to have <coughs> claims, right? Claims are a fundamental part of our system, so let's have some claims business logic. And a claim is a general term for somebody hit my car, made a big death in it, and now I have to get money to fix it. And the insurance company is going to take a long time more to make it. Thank you. We have this concept of a claim. All right. If I just create claims, is that interesting, business-wise, business people? What's that? If we just create them? If we just create them, is that interesting? Probably want to be able to modify them. Right, we want to be able to modify them. For the purpose of this exercise, we're looking at three things. We're looking at, I want to be able to create claims. I want to be able to submit quotes against it for repair. And I want to be able to settle it, cut a check for it. Those are the three behaviors. So we're going to repeat the business logic for those other two things. If you missed the most important business function to deny. To deny it. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. It's a small interest. We've got to grow up into So we have to have a means of capturing quotes as we get them from the repair places, right? So that's the user interface element. And it's probably also the main logic associated with the with the quote on the back end. Oh, you're doing it. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Well, just uh, just the quote as the business logic. Don't make contact. So it's print quote, right? Right. If we capture the user interface, uh, it should be in the main logic, right? Yeah. That's what we're talking. Very good. All right. One more thing. We have to be able to settle a claim, right? So we need user interface for settlement. This is a claim. Do you have an attorney? Oh. What's that? <laughs> Not yet. Settlement. And business logic side, we also have to have a settlement, right? Yeah. Vain logic, settlement. Just uh, we're, again, we're talking real general, for general terms here. So we have a settlement. Yep. <laughs> okay. Quick check. Do we have a use for system yet? Yeah. <laughs> we have a user interface that allows us to create claims. We have business logic for it. We can put quotes against it. We can settle it. What can't we do right now? There is logic that is missing, and that is for the persistence layer. If we've got a persistence framework here, we also have to have code that actually does the persistence for this code, right? Okay. It's domain specific, we have to have it. You can't just have JPA with no customization for your application. Okay. Persistence without telling the instrument, telling it how to persist, is kind of useless. So we also have custom code here for persistence. So this is um, application persistence. Application persistence. Oh, that's right. 
Okay. In your experience so far, does this match up with how software is built at a very general level? You have frameworks and tools that you use across the board, and you also have custom code that you write for the specific business purpose. Are we are we on the same track so far? Okay, if you don't do that, let me know because I really want to hear about your project. <laughs> That'll be an interesting conversation. One other thing, a couple of assumptions. First of all, we haven't said anything about um, the information on our insurance, the people that are actually recovering with insurance. We can safely assume that we have the ability, when we create a claim, we have the ability to look somebody up and find their insurance information, whether or not they're valid. Not going to be important for the exercise. Okay, a couple of rules before we get to the interesting part. This is the boring part of this. We had to start somewhere, and this is where we're starting. Now we get into the more interesting things, hopefully. Uh, rules are, you can't have more than one functionality. If you guys later on decide to add frameworks, or you decide to add business logic, that's great. It has to have one purpose. Now, in reality, there are things that, um, out in the business world, there are frameworks that we can pick up, there's components we can pick up that are multi-purpose, but when we start looking at these across, uh, across the teams here, it's going to be very difficult for us to understand that. So we're going to keep it to one concept per architectural element, uh, framework, component, and one concept per business component. Does that make sense? Okay. It's really the only rule. Other than that, creativity, like, we'll let creativity reign. So the game is, once we have something here, we want to look at the changes that affect architecture. Okay? We've got our very first change coming up in that with our existing system here, we have found that uh, the business has come back and said, hey, we're getting killed by our competitors because they have better fraud detection. We're spending lots and lots of money on fraud. People are submitting fraudulent claims. So the functionality that we have to enter, or we have to deal with is we need to be able to compare a new claim against any previous claim to see if there's any fraudulent activity going on. But again, the detail of that is very complicated if you're actually writing that. Is that important if we're looking at general architecture? Okay, so in this period, once we actually start this, this is gonna be the real, the real sessions as we go on. What we're gonna do is we're gonna to present to you the business motivation or the change motivation, and you're gonna figure out what that means in the architecture. Well, this first time, obviously, we're going to do that with you so you can see how the game is played. So as I'm changing architecture, uh, first of all, if I have the functionality of, I've gotta create an ability to go back and check and see if there's fraudulent, uh, fraudulent claims against a new claim. Does that mean I have to enter a new framework? Is there a new component that's coming from this? Just, well, do we feel like, does it feel like there's something new there on that side? Okay, you said yes, I saw a no back there. John, you don't think there's any new frameworks, components, or anything like that, right? No. Okay, what do you think? Well, I think there needs to be a fraud system. Unless we want to build it. Okay, all right. There needs to be a fraud system unless we want to build it. Okay, now we're getting into the architecture game. This is the interesting part about this, and these are the decisions we face every day. These are the ones that you're going to be making your minds up on in your teams after the first couple rounds. So, what we're going to do is we're going to show you what a first change looks like. And on the first change, it's really very simple. We need to be able to create the functionality of doing a fraud check. Okay? Real simple fraud check means I go back and I look and see if there's any commonality with previous claims. Same claim submitted multiple times. Somebody is uh, you know, submitting a series of claims. There's a lot of logic to it that we're not going to be worried about. So this is just simply I create my fraud check. Okay? This is the change to functionality. So we're going to go to our change motivation board here. On the change motivation, so what is it? What's our actual motivating factor? Fraud control, okay? This is the competitive pressure. When you get right down to it, the business value is we need to be able to compete more effectively with the other companies out there. So we're going to reduce our fraud, uh, the money we, we uh, pay out for fraudulent activity. So the change motivation is this. I got a fraud check. If we go back and look at our domain logic, do we have anything here for fraud check right now? No. So we've got to add this, right? Yeah. Our change is we're going to add the fraud check to the domain logic. Right there. Do we have anything to change in the presentation? No. No? Yes. Yes? yes. Okay, put your hands. How many of you think that our presentation is fine at this point? One, two. Oh, it's the man. No. <laughs> How many of you think that there has to be some sort of user interface change? Okay, most of you. What's the change? Real simple. What change do we have to make? An alert, right? Okay, fraud alert. So, when we go through, and the important part about this is right before we settle the claim, we want to have a fraud alert that shows up, right? In software, we have really three choices that we can do each time that we make changes to the system. We can create something new, 
which we did right here. We created new functionality, fraud check. We can refactor existing functionality. We can take the existing stream user interface for settled claims and add a fraud check to it. Or we can completely replace something. Those are the three games that we can play with an architecture. What, what do you think is the right one to play here? Rework. Rework? Rework the existing stream? All right, works for me. So we will have a refactor. <laughs> Refactor settlement. UI. So we'll save that over here. All right. Any other changes that we need to make to satisfy the change? Uh, the change motivation. Persistence. Okay. Persistence. Get the store. The alert. Okay. Persistence. We want to store the alert. We're not going to put that one up for now. But that is a valid point. Okay, these are the things you have to look at. Where does the effect cross the system? Anybody else? Query claims. Query claims? Okay, there's some functionality for that, right? Yeah. Hopefully, it's embodied within this fraud check. That's the assumption we're making right now. If not, well, we've got more work to do. We'll find out what gets quality assurance. Did I tell you that you have quality assurance coming? No. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Flip my mind. So now this is this is the change notification. This is the change modification. This is going to impact our architecture. We want this to be as current as possible. This is our record on time. This is what we're going to look at at the end of the session. So what do we want to do to this based upon this information? Add those. Add it. But we don't want to just carry the stickies over because we'll lose our record. So we're going to repeat these stickies. I'm going to have Francine do this for me. We're going to repeat the stickies over on our, our um, architecture and just make the changes that we've identified and change motivation. Okay, so we uh, the project, the project the app, and then change self finder to include the project. Okay. So while she's doing that, let's talk a little bit about that. I'll give you a minute to make the same change. Refactor Okay, so there's really two changes we're making on here. The first one is, again, we want to move fraud check as new functionality into our domain. We got that? Yeah. Excellent. And we want to take the set of claim and refactor it. We don't want to add something new there. We want to refactor what we have, right? So you can change that one. Here's our old set of claim. Now we've got set of claim, including fraud check. Okay. Are we all here so far? <laughs> These guys are ready to deliver over here. All right. Okay, so that's the first round. Has anything interesting architecturally happened yet? No, not a thing. We've changed functionality in the application, which is important to the business. But as architects are being concerned about architecture, nothing's changed yet. So we're going to play one more round. And this time, uh, we're going to go a little bit faster. We'll give you a chance to follow up and see what after we get it, gentlemen. We'll give, you, we'll give you a chance to work in the groups. Um, we'll give you a chance to make the changes. Let me just talk you through it first so we can get through all the changes we're going to make. So I'll play this round up here, and then we'll add it all at one time so that we're all on the same page. Does that work? Excellent. Okay. So the second motivator. Here's the new uh, change motivation that's coming in. We already know that we have functionality for checking against claims in our existing system, but it turns out that the industry has also been doing some work as well. So the insurance industry as a whole has created a clearinghouse that does the same thing. So now we have an external system that we are now required by law, this is a regulatory change, to go and compare against with our system. Okay? We've already got the functionality, but now we've got additional things to do. What's the impact? Let's look at the framework impact first, the architectural impact, non-business uh, non specific. What are we going to do? First thing. An API to the external system. What's that? An API to the external system. We need an API to the external system. Okay, so this is, we'll call this Clearinghouse API. Clearinghouse API. Because <laughs> if we create an API that talks to an external system, well, we have to, obviously, we have the architecture there. We also have to write our own code around that that talks to our application and the, and the API. Yes, we do. Okay, so this next change, we're going to have API. Now we've got custom code that is API to app communication. 
Okay, now this is the first interesting architectural change in that we've got to talk to an external system. We see that there's, you know, there's more to more to this talking to external systems than meet the eye that meets the eye. What do we do about our existing functionality? What do we do about this box right here? One, we need one down here too. Any changes? Yeah. Yes. Depends on what data is coming back from it. The presentation. Depends on what data is coming back from it. Okay. Depends on what data is coming back. At a more general level, we probably want to respond based on what we hear communication-wise, right? Okay. So we have to do what here? Well, are we only consuming the API, or are we also updating the clearinghouse with our information? Updating the clearinghouse is outside the scope right now. Okay. So you can just assume that you're querying the API. Okay. So that would be an example of a business question you want to ask the customers. Okay. So the change that we need to make here in the domain is what? Business logic. That's not. Okay, business logic. Now we've got, we've added. Did we add the functionality? Okay, so we have the functionality to the user interface, and we have the fraud check here. Do we have the fraud check, Frenzy? No, it looks like we didn't have a fraud check. It's on the floor somewhere, which is usually where the business logic goes. So we have fraud check. Do we need to refactor that? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going to be talking to an external system in addition to our own. We've got to make a change, right? Give us a fraud check. So here, we refactor fraud check. Oh, we need another one. Oh, you need another one. Yeah, this one, the delta. This one, we need to make change. Is there any implication on the user interface? Just tell the alert, no. right? No. 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 We got a nose over here. No. Yes, over here. You say yes. So we need the alert, right? Okay. We need the alert. We know we have it. The alert is here from last yeah. round. We've got a question. Yeah. 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 Okay, one at a time, please. We'll have a chance to have all kinds of fun with this in your groups. Say that again, ma'am. Do you want to know that they disagree? Do we want to know if they disagree? Okay. Does the answer from one system, does that is that significant from the answer from another system? Do we want to see both, or do we want to see if there's a conflict? We may. These are the things that we have to worry about with our business customers, right? In all honesty, yeah, we'll probably change this so we can see where we're getting a hit from our fraud check. But in the, uh, during the course of this, this exercise, we're not going to really get back to the fraud check. So it's okay to just say, you know what, user interface is good. If there's fraud, there's a flag, and you can go figure it out later. So, so far, what we've gotten is we've gone through two rounds of the game. The second round, which is the, the second round is the one where we've had the first interesting architectural change. Now, I say interesting as a relative term. They're going to get a little more interesting after, after this point. But you want, I want to give you a chance to see what it looks like when you have an architectural change along with business logic. Okay, clear as mud, right? Yeah, we'll, have, we'll do the update in just a second. As we go through this, the way that we're going to do this is um, we're going to have about a seven minute segment where I'm going to give you the change. You have a minute to interview me as a customer and then you adjust your architecture. At the end of that, we're going to have a very quick quality assurance round. Quality assurance is pass fail. If you fail quality assurance check, you get a big red dot on your architecture. Of course, you know, you don't want that, do you? But then when we're done with that, we're going to push the change off to our current architecture. So it's really two parts. It's discuss the architecture, lay out what you're going to do, plan for it, and then afterwards you're going to go back and you're going to apply it after you've had a chance to look at it. Okay, so are we clear so far? Somewhat clear on how this works? Okay, we're going to go off the rails a couple of times. The important thing here is that we just we, we try to um, we try to pick out something interesting about this. Over the course of the exercise, if you see a pattern developing, if you say to yourself, you know what, we keep touching this stuff, or I keep having to change this code, identify it. Okay, make a note of it. These are the things we want to know. We want to learn what we discover as we look at architecture from a from a higher level view. Okay, if we don't discover anything, then I'll have to tell you all the discoveries myself, and you know your discoveries might be mine. I hear it too. Okay, so we're ready to play. Excellent. Let's make these adjustments so that we're all starting to see current architecture. You should have an API and app specific and external layer. And the refactor project. Keep a complete change. Yeah. 
because they're already up there already. So we're just clearing the Good time to move on to the next round. Now is where you start playing. Okay? Not going to be on my rails anymore. You'll have more fun with it now if I'm not telling you what to do. So, let's talk about the next change motivation. Okay? On your sheet, as you're tracking this, please write down the change motivation so you have track of it on your sheet so we can see what caused what changes to your architecture. So, at the top of the sheet, just kind of like you identify. There's new business rule. This is a competitive, uh, this is competitive pressures. Auditors from the accounting department not, now must approve any claim that's over $5,000. So you can't, your adjuster, the person that's actually doing all this work right now, cannot approve a claim by themselves if it's over $5,000. So we've got auditors that are gonna come into the workflow now. Okay, okay? that's the change motivation. Okay, you have a minute to interview me. Any questions? Yes, sir. So are they working on their own system or are they actually working on the one that Auditors will be working within the same software system. What security roles are they going to have? Only auditors can approve checks over $5,000 or settlements over $5,000. So you have to make sure that whoever um, whoever does the approval is an auditor. You need to know who approved, which auditor approved uh, a claim over that amount. Can an auditor an auditor return a claim for clarification or like for ask for more information and have it resubmitted for approval, or is it a one-time only pass to outside of scope? Okay. So don't worry about the circling back. Okay. <coughs> one one rule that you have to enforce: the business logic here is if it's over five thousand, auditor has to approve it. You cannot close. You cannot settle a claim until the auditor has approved it. Can an auditor close it? Can an auditor close it? No, all they can do is they can go in and they can say they authorize it. It's still the, it's still the adjuster that's closing it or settling it. Okay, any last questions? Is it binary, approve or disapprove? Uh, for the purpose of this exercise, yes. Approve or disapprove is the, is the two choices. Okay. Okay, off you go. Report your changes. So we need an on your change sheet. We'll combine and look at it as soon as you're done. You have a format. We need, so we need some persistence changes. Okay, can I get everyone's attention for a minute? We have two ways that we can do this. One way is that each of your teams will learn individually. The other way is that we'll all learn from each other's teams. My recommendation is that you actually listen in when we do the QA. I'll be as brief as I can with each of the individual groups, um, and we all listen in on that. Um, otherwise, if you're still working on your architecture with somebody else is being quality assured, you may miss something important that they picked up on or vice versa. So is that okay with everybody? All right, so whatever, you're done, whatever you've done up to this point, it's good enough. Let's find out if you have pass or fail. I've got my notes, my stickies. <laughs> Let's start with this group over here. So, the business change is auditors must approve anything over $5,000, right? They captured that correctly? Yep. So what they did is they added new user interface logic, custom user interface logic for audit review. Okay, I'm assuming that this is uh, something from the auditor team, so that's a user interface for the auditor. Okay, good. All right, we have a workflow engine. Oh, they added architecture. Cool, very right, good. It's yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have a security framework. What does security framework do? Provides infrastructure for uh, the role. The, uh, the role. Okay. So authentication. Authentication. Excellent. We've got self claim uh, associated workflow. We've got um, ACLs for auditors. Access control. Access control. Okay. So, do they meet the business requirements? Don't yes. Oh, we've got the audit log, of course. Yeah, very important. Okay, they meet the business requirements, we think? They over-engineered with the word <laughs> We'll find out. I'm going to give them the green sticker so far. Looks like they've got a place. Give them a hand. Green up. Okay, let's move your architecture up. Let's move your architecture up. Make sure that they've got it. No, you move the stickies. Remember, change log stays. Make new stickies. All right, over here. <laughs> We've got a new auditor UI. The auditor UI is the place where we go and do approvals. All right. We've got a refactor the settlement. 
What are we going to do in the settlement? When it comes back. <laughs> okay, so we can see what the auditor did, right? All right, they added Active Directory authentication system. More architecture, is that good? Yes. All right, Active Directory. Is this internal functionality or is this an external system? External. external. But they've got it in their domain logic. Is that correct? No. Uh-oh, what's the problem? That's the code to the interface. That's the code interface, excellent. It's on the green sticky, that's a framework sticky. We've got a fail on QA. Oh. Not that big of a deal. Not that big of a deal. Okay. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Now, I'd just like to point out that the color coding these guys are using, and there's some experts at this table, allegedly. <laughs> experts use color coding of the darker stickies for framework and the lighter stickies for custom code. What's their bias? <laughs> no. Code. It's all about the code. Not invented here. John, you've heard of XP, right? <laughs> no. Okay, it's a lot better than this one. So here's what we've got. We've got authorization. We've got authorization for systems. We've got refactor's claims user interface, or business logic. We've got auditor approval. We've got refactor, the, the create claim process, and logging authorization. They get the business requirements? You betcha. Absolutely. Is it required to add new architecture on the frameworks or components level? Not yet. No. Green sticker. <laughs> Okay, role-based security. Role management. Now, this is the presentation layer, so are you creating user interface for roles? Okay, so you actually created the user interface to manage all this. Now, these guys are getting, uh, getting down to the point level. This is good stuff. It's out of scope, but it's good stuff. They're going to refactor the, what's that one? Is that turn? Return software. Well, if I can't read it, we're going to have to give them a fail on this one. Okay, two left, and we'll get to the next round. All right, so what we've got here, we've got otters must approve settlement over 5K. That's change on which, thank you for knowing that. They've got it actually on here, so we can look at the changes as we go down. We are Refactor settlement UI to accommodate the limit. We have authorization of the business logic, and we have refactoring of the persistence layer. Now, the refactor settlement UI to accommodate this, can this imply that an auditor is working with the system? They're going to refactor the settlement page. Who's using the settlement page? Agent. Okay, compliance agent, the adjuster, not the auditor. Okay, so if we refactor existing screens for some a new role, is that allowed? I know we do it. I know software does it all the time. But do we? Is that is that a good choice? Okay, it'll work. This will work. They're going to be bit by it later. I'll tell you, but. <laughs> Certainly not least. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have a login page. We need a login page for our auditors? Absolutely. We've got auditor approve and reject user interface. Do they get right to the heart of the matter? Absolutely. Uh, check claim amount. They have rules here. They have logic in the system that's going to check the claim amount. They've got roles and permissions added. Roles and permissions. How are you going to accomplish that? Custom code? Okay, perfect. Oh, they've got LDAP. Now, you'll notice the LDAP is sitting over in their external systems. The right place for it? Yes. Absolutely. Green sticker? They get it? All right, give them a hand. Green sticker. Hey, do you guys want to score after we got our rent on? Called shenanigans. All right, ready for next round? If you haven't already, make sure that you update your architecture. Leave stickies on there. Make new ones so that we can see the change. Here's our next round. We're going to go a little faster now. Here we go. The CIO is playing golf with a buddy of this, who happens to have a proprietary arcane authentication system that he's selling. Guess what? He lost the last hole. Now you have to implement it. You have to take whatever you've done for authentication and throw it away and replace it with this external system with this really funky interface. Detail, not important. Okay? You have to refactor your authentication. Regardless of how it is right now, you have to change it. Okay? One minute questions. 
Yeah, exactly. So it's not, it's not standards based at all. Not standards based. Never even heard of standards. What's that? Yes, you have an API. I don't want to tell you about it, but you have to look at it. I'm sorry, say that again. It's on the user interface. It's replaced. It's on the user interface. Don't worry about the user interface for that. That's an external system. So interacting with the users. Not, not to worry about it. Yeah. Okay, we need a refit. <coughs> refit from some other layer. Doesn't matter. You guys pick it. You guys pick what the API is. You have to name it. That goes in your state. Okay, last questions. Yes, sir. You have to buy it or actually use it? Oh, you bought it. And you have to use it. Your, your CIO is standing in your office telling you you have to buy it now. The authentication is an external system. You will talk to it to do all your authentication responsibilities. Okay. If you haven't done so already, stop working on your architecture and just let's take a look at what we've got. I've noticed, uh, based on our time, we have 20 minutes left for this session, unless you guys want to go to like 7 8. You don't want to go to the party, do you? <laughs> Never mind. I'm not even going to try to compete with that. Isn't this the party? Of course. I'm going to try to, we're going to try to get through two more rounds. So here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to look at your, this yourself and just ask the questions, okay, based upon our needs here, did you add the external system? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Did you add an API, a custom code, into that external system? Yes. yes. Excellent. Did you refactor your authentication in your business domain to match that? Yes. yes. Anybody not do those things? Oh, no. So a red sticker. So we're accounting for that in our API. Yeah. Oh, you're accounting for it? Yes. Yeah. So you have dual authentication. No. No. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, well, this one will be fun. Fun is a relative term. Are we ready? Oh, what? I get to do it? Is it an option just to fire your CIO? Yeah, I've heard it. No, it's a mess with it. Go ahead and move your architecture if you haven't done it right now. Give me another one. A few seconds to do that. And I apologize about the time pressure. This is, uh, we're trying to get a lot done in a short amount of time, so the most important thing is changes. Are you done yet? 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 Are you done Excellent. Here's what happened. Remember that, uh, that clearinghouse system that uh, the government mandated that we have to check against uh, all claims, that, that centralized clearinghouse? Yeah. Well, the vendor went out of business. Uh -oh. <laughs> got a new vendor there, but it's a completely different system, completely different API. But so whatever you've got that touches that has to be refactored. Piece of cake. Ready? Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> They provide the same. No, they provide similar functionality. It's not the same. Oh, we're going to give you three minutes for this round. Okay, time. Put down your architecture. Step away from the table. Okay, quality assurance check. Self audited. Do you have a new API? Did you rewrite the API? Yes. yes. Did you connect to the new? Do you show the new external system? Yes. 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 All right. Did you change your code? Raise your hand if your group changed your functional code. If you change your functional code, code, not the API code. Did you change your domain source? What did you change? Uh, we touched the, uh, the 
the fraud check. Okay? Touch the fraud check. And that's because I told them something different than I told anybody else that asked me. What did I tell you guys? That the functionality is substantially different. Substantially different. Okay? So they, they realized that if it was substantially different enough, they're going to have to touch their, their functional code. Okay. APIs are great for abstracting system communication, abstracting um, functionality on two sides. Sooner or later, you're running into problems, right, John? He's giving me a look. I love that look. Okay, so we're going to put an end to the game right now. I apologize. I was hoping to get through a few more rounds, but if we don't stop now, uh, we're not going to be able to talk about the big picture. So I want to go back to that. Let me just show you, tell you a couple of things that you would have been in store for had we had a little more time. Uh, let's see, we had hackers that are going to break into the system that would require you to encrypt all your data from the back. We had uh, a bad business decision of quotes had to be submitted electronically. So all those shops that would call in quotes from then, from that point forward, couldn't put, put passing quotes anymore. Of course, that sort of thing never happens in real life, those bad business decisions. Um, mobile submission tool, uh, you'll give the, uh, your insurance the ability to submit a claim from their mobile phones right on the spot. Actually, has anybody seen this? It actually came out with, uh, I think Allstate did this recently. Really cool, great idea. So this is where the inspiration for this one came from. All right, um, the insurance company acquired somebody else, and now you have to be able to at least view data, claims data in the other system. How many of you have ever done integrations at that level? Acquired a company, integrated their systems with yours? Fun stuff, guys? Sucks. Yes, it does, <laughs> badly. All right, uh, let's see. Change regulatory requirements, not important. Oh, uh, former insurers, they sue because you lost their data in the hacker incident. So now you have to go back and you have to change your logic to make sure that if anybody's policy goes, uh, if their policy goes inactive, 90 days later their data has to be purged from the system. And the last one is, um, remember that authentication system that your CIO bought? Well, the one guy that knew how to run it was laid off because of the, you know, the lawsuit. So now you have nobody that knows how to do that and you have to rebuild your authentication from scratch. Now, <laughs> the serious question about all that is, do these things happen in real life? Yes, yes they do. Okay? They happen all the time. Some of these are a little bit more frequent than others. Obviously, functional changes, business changes, the business pressures are the most common changes. But these other things do happen. And we have to deal with them architecturally somehow. Did we see any patterns as we went through this? And I realize we didn't have a huge number of rounds, but what sort of patterns did we see as we went through these architectural changes? Anybody? We changed the urge to over-engineer. Say that again? Urge to over-engineer. Urge to over-engineer. You want to protect yourself in the future, right? How do you protect yourself in the future? John, how do you protect yourself in the future? Write lots of tests. Write lots of tests, okay? That's yes. one way to do it. All right, what else? How else do we protect ourselves from the future? Keep it simple. Yeah, abstract things, have interfaces at key points. Okay, abstraction. How many of us have a tendency to abstract before there's a real need? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the first one. I have written full on front to back frameworks just because I thought it'd be cool to have the functionality. So <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely in that camp. The important thing to track there is when we're dealing with architecture, the thing that's really interesting to us is the cost of change. How much does it cost to change our architecture? Look back on your sheet. <coughs> if we change business logic in the existing application, is that very expensive? It depends, but generally speaking, in our experience so far, was it expensive to change our business logic? It's just a Mostly thing. adding and refactoring, right? It's it's pretty high risk. Risk. What's that? It tends to be high risk. It tends to be high risk. Okay? It also goes down a certain channel. These guys over here, if you look at their architecture, it's a lot of custom code. Okay? And that's fine until there is a major sea change in how your application works. Then you have major refactoring. Okay? It's a strategy, it's a viable one, but it is something that you have to choose. You have to decide which way you're going. So there's cost. Does it cost us much to replace a framework? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Speaking from experience, how many of you ever swapped out a framework in an existing system? One? No, I see the pain over there. You guys are still twitching. Okay, it's very expensive. A framework's supposed to make things easier, right? But at the same time, if you have the framework there and you need to change and go away from that framework, now all of a sudden, all of a sudden it's really expensive, doesn't it? Okay, what else is expensive in terms of architectural investment? <coughs> what sort of things from our list that we see? Database. Database. Why is the database expensive? Or because it's such as that. Now, you did that to yourself. I didn't know you do it. 
Okay, changing external systems, changing major pieces of function, I would actually pose that this, that is a that is a framework just like anything else. It's a persistent system, it's external, but if you try to swap databases, how expensive is that? Yeah, it's okay. okay, you pay a lot, that's expensive. Okay, so the game here is how do we keep from having to pay these huge costs over time, right? I hope that's okay, is that? Do we like paying costs? Well, maybe you guys do. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of great work going on over here. Billable hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on how many hours we can charge. One thing you kept saying is it's expensive to change, to change, to change. Don't build it till you need it. It's one approach too, right? Yeah. Don't, a lot of people when you're building software, a lot of times they'll say, well, "I think we might need that in a year." That you is try to always throw it out in the future, and it's. I mean, don't build it till you need it. Make it flexible enough that you can add. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. Let's get one at a time. Don't build until you need it. What's the what's the acronym for that, John? Yeah, yeah, Over in the XP yeah. world? Yeah. Yeah. Yagme. Yeah. Or drive yeah. your pragmatic yeah. 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 This is actually the intersection of Yagme and Yagme. You aren't you ain't gonna need it, and no, I am gonna need it. So we're getting into that boundary area, but you have to have a you're saying there has to be a real reason for me to put it in there, right? Yeah. Okay, don't build architecture unless you have a real reason. That's a strategy. Give me some other strategies for architecture. So on Sticky, we had workflow. We were thinking about a workflow system, but that didn't ever materialize in our architecture. Okay, so they were thinking about a workflow system. Would it have benefited them very much in the rounds that we had added workflow? This is the auditor thing, right? That we added it? Okay, would it have benefited in that? <coughs> yeah, we did. No. Maybe. They probably they pay more for it, right? Yeah. You pay more for flexibility, so they add a new system, they pay more, it's going to take more, more time to, and effort to invest in that. But if they have workflow changes coming in the future, like for instance, we now have claims processors that do the entry work. I'm sorry, claims entry people that do the entry work, and the adjusters now don't do entries. That's a workflow change, isn't it? Yeah. Guess who's going to have the cheapest amount, uh, who's going to have the cheapest change when that particular functionality comes around? That's these guys. Okay? There is a certain amount of betting that you do. This is really like handicapping a sports event. As an architect, you really have to compare these things. What is the likelihood of this changing, that changing? You've got a list of things that change there. What are the most common changes? What changed most often? External systems. What's that? The external systems. External systems for you? What changed for you guys most often? Domain. Domain logic, user interface? It's pretty nice. Right. For you guys, what changed most often? Persistence. Yeah. Persistence. <laughs> Back down. So that kind of gives you a pointer for where investment is justified, right? It's a bet. I'll give you an example of this. When I first started at Amersys, um, we had built a system that was intended to be literally shipped on servers into hospitals. They were just going to sit inside of their room. We had to build security, make sure that they couldn't crack into this thing and steal our data. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. We realized halfway through the implementation of that, you know what? Why don't we just do a web-based application and just keep it outside of their outside of their environment? Gosh, that'd be easy. Guess how much work went into the refactor? The assumptions that we made at the beginning of the project were completely off base. So we have to protect ourselves from those things. And now we're starting to get into the strategies. You ain't going to need it as one aspect of this. Don't build it until you need it. Well, that's exactly what we did. We didn't build it until we needed it. When we needed it, it was really expensive, right? So this side of it may have been a little more beneficial. No, I am going to need it. Let's build it from the outset. A few other things. What are some of the other strategies that we can use for architecture? Uh, protecting ourselves from paying a high cost for changing architecture. Don't do web logic. Don't do web. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about the whole proprietary thing later. We'll, we'll talk. What else? Leveraging frameworks. Okay, so. leveraging frameworks. Okay, there's tools out there, right? All right, leverage frameworks. What about persistence or data layers? Oh, that's I'm going to steal something from what you just said. Layers. How many of you read um, the? I mean, you're familiar with uh, how networking works nowadays, the, the evolution of networking as it exists today. Sure. What sits at the bottom of our networking protocols? The very bottom. Okay. Just way down. Ethernet, right? Okay. This, is, this is the fundamental functionality. This is the fundamental uh, definition of how communication takes place. Do we ever code for Ethernet anymore? No. No. There's a whole stack of technologies. Each one is more of an abstraction on top of the other ones, but it also has more power. So this concept of layers is important. 
Frameworks are layers. They give us common functionality. If we pick the right ones, do we have to worry about rebuilding that functionality? No. So layers, the strategy of layers, and this one is well documented. As a matter of fact, it's in that, um, that architectural patterns book that's uh, um, Robert Fowler. Robert, sorry, yeah. Martin Fowler did. Um, it's, it's in there, it's one of the things that he talks about. Very important thing. So the layers, paying attention to layers and building on top of layers is a strategy. Those of you who have spent time around Alistair, 2004, wrote an article. Anybody remember the article? I was actually surprised when I went looking for this because I've heard the term for several years now and I forgot where the term came from. And I realized that it was Alistair that said it. Incremental re-architecting. Back in 2004, Alistair wrote an article on, hey, architecture is a problem, especially when we're dealing with it in an agile context and we are changing over time. Architectural refact, our art, incremental re-architecting is a proven strategy for working. Can anybody summarize that? What is architect? Incremental re-architecting. Sorry, I have to slow down for that one. What is it? Did anybody, anyone summarize that for us? We just did it. We just did like five sessions of it. So, it's this, right? It, it is, in the sense that you, you're making changes in the system, but never did we make a pervasive, across the board change in the entire system. We, we didn't. We didn't have to do that. Right. We were hopefully in a position to be able to isolate some of the changes. Who's your we? Our team here. Right. Do you guys make more sweeping changes? No? I know you touched business logic. Okay. Here's the thing. We refactor. Yeah, we refactor. Exactly. The thing that we don't have here is we don't have the measurement of exactly what it costs to do this. To do this versus this, I'll tell you, based upon experience, they pay a heavier cost. Whether or not they could actually get that done within an iteration or two iterations is, is questionable. But now you have to deal with the issue of if I go long enough, if I go long enough without this, is it going to cause problems for me? So you have to figure out a strategy. Yeah. Incremental rearchitecting is exactly what Jonathan is saying. It is you make changes over time. You have your destination in mind. You make the changes gradually. Do not let your system go offline for six months while you're trying to make a massive, you know, this massive change. You know, one of the things I noticed was uh, there were several, case, several cases where there was something we knew needed to happen, but it was kind of unclear whether it belonged on one side of the line or the other side of the line, in other words, whether it was in the persistence layer or whether it was in the domain layer, or was it in the presentation layer. And in some cases, we're kind of like, you know, we'll leave it there for now, but let's see what the next change is, because maybe we're going to have to pull this back or push this forward. Right, and that's an example of of what strategy? Okay, you ain't gonna need it. There's actually a refinement that, that I really want. And that is last responsible moment. How many of you heard that term, last responsible moment? Okay, good, excellent. Last responsible moment means that you delay these decisions until the last, not possible moment, but responsible moment. You don't know what's gonna happen. There are a lot of unknowns out there, so you wait. Until you do, you can reduce the uncertainty. Now you don't have a moving target. So last responsible moment is another strategy that we can use. How many have heard of real options? We talked about in the roundtable a while ago here in Salt Lake, real options. Um, Chris, can you summarize real options for us? I don't know that I can. Um, <clears throat> the, the pieces of it that I've seen, I'm uh, pretty sure not the, the whole thing, but uh, what I saw was basically um, breaking your possible paths down with like basically a binary or a more than binary tree. Um, we could make this decision, we could make that decision and then trying at the end to have basically the value, you know, maybe even in dollars, laid out. I think that's part of it, I don't think that's the whole thing. It is, it is. You have two different decisions you're going down. You understand both of them. You actually pursue both of them until one of them proves itself over the other. That's an investment. You're investing in two different possible outcomes. That's the real option. There's more to it than that. It's, you know, it's originally coming from the financial community, but it works well in software. And that if you've got a system and you really can't decide between a couple of different options, Implement them both until you can. You'll have something real. There's two other things I want to cover before we wrap up on this session. Two other strategies that are really important for architecture. The first one is, um, in conjunction with incremental re-architecting, there's walking skeletons. You guys have all heard about walking skeletons, right? Walking skeletons is a great strategy, not just for functionality in the application, but also for functionality in our architecture. If you cannot build a walking skeleton of your architecture and have it function within some environment and have provide value to the application, are you doing a good job of building your architecture? 
Probably not. I would bet that you aren't. Prove me wrong, but walking skeleton works really well for this. How many of you have gone through the process of creating an architecture that starts at design a new interface, mock it so that everybody can start using a version of it to do their own thing, and then you build it as other people are using the mock implementation of that? Have you ever done that before? Good. Excellent strategy for this. You don't want, architecture should not be a blocker. It should not keep you from being able to build a business. <coughs> if you're running in an, agile, in an agile world and you have, you know, you have new requirements coming in all the time and changing business direction, you can't afford that. It gets way too expensive. You've got to be able to shift direction with your architecture. And that means doing the least possible amount of work over time and adjusting along with your application. Okay? There's no right answers to this. This is a tough, tough feel. Architecture doubly so. Um, just because of the fact that you have to be part, you know, soothsayer, part uh, sports bookie, part, uh, you know, counselor to the business. For the business people in here, how many of you had a chance, how, how many of you are now looking at this and going, wow, I didn't realize the breadth of the impact of changes? Anybody have that experience? One person? All right, well, I made one person. I, I've achieved my goal. The thing is that the business people don't understand this world that we live in. They don't understand the implications of all this. And if you're not telling them this, if you're not going through this exercise and seeing and letting them understand what happens to these things, there's always going to be a conflict and the world's going to be doing this. Now, I love this happening as much as the next guy, but you know, by the end of the day, we're going to have a shit software, right? There's one last thing I want to leave you with this concept for strategy, and that is, again, Alistair talks about this all the time, and that is necessary architecture has business value. If you're building architecture, the question you have to ask yourself is, does this piece of architecture I'm building, does it deliver business value? Okay, how many of us, developer-wise, architect-wise, have built architecture without a clear, immediate business value? <laughs> oh, come on. Everybody oh, wants to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we can't help it. This is part of, this is the bet that we make. This is, this is our world. We deal with this. Sometimes we have to gamble. Sometimes we're really wrong. I won't tell you about times I'm wrong, because then you won't think I'm as cool as I am. <laughs> but it's a complicated field. The most important things you can do, other than the strategies that we've talked about, is understand it. You need to speak the language. You need to, you need to immerse yourself in it. If you have somebody that claims to be an architect, and they can't code their architecture, stop listening to them. Okay? If you have anybody that disagrees with that, have them come talk to me. I'll ask them. Okay? Architects must code. They must eat their own dog food. If they can't do that, they're really going to give you an architecture that works? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, this was the first time I ran through this exercise, and as you can see, it was pretty frantic. Hopefully, you got something valuable out of it. If nothing else, the conversation and, and just the exposure to. Things change over time. Every once in a while, take a step back. Any questions before I wrap up? I have a question. Yes. What about a backwards compatibility strategy? Like we talked about throwing an LDAP bridge on top of our new authentication API so we didn't have to rewrite anything else. Right. What's your experience with that? Is that for a, a re-architecture? Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of it does. Yeah, what, you're, what, what he's saying is we have new business changes. That are gonna, we have things that are going to change our architecture, but we want to maintain backwards compatibility. For isolation. Right, isolation exactly. So you know, this is good strategy for slow migration. You know, this is a that's actually one of the baseline strategies for doing this incremental re-architecture. But there's a corollary to that. If you do this, you also must at some point go back in, fix it, get rid of it. Okay? Backwards compatibility is great up to a point. And if you want to know what that point is, talk to Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, quick question. As we were talking, we were saying that changing um, persistence is actually more expensive than uh, domain and interface, right? Um, that makes sense to a point, uh, to me at least. Uh, if you go from SQL Server to Oracle, yes, it's very expensive. But if you go from Java to C++, I would consider that way more expensive than the database change. Right. Is that correct? Yes, but that's not, is that just a domain logic change or is that a, a fundamental architectural change across the board? That's fine. It's really a matter of scope. I mean, any of these, you, you can take any two examples and they can be out of balance with each other. The generalities are changes to frameworks are generally more expensive than changes in business logic, generally. Any other questions? 
again, thank you for your time. If you have any specific feedback, I take bad feedback too. I, I want to make this better. So if you have anything that any suggestions make it better, if you think I'm a jerk or I called time too soon, let me know about it. I appreciate it. Okay? Thank you, everybody.